Hello everyone, today we talk about the Battle of Tewksbury that I hope to be pronouncing correctly as I'm not going to remake the video uh, otherwise. Anyhow, it, it's an important battle of the Wars of the Roses which took place on May the 4th, 1471. In fact, in um, south of, as we will see now, of the town of Tewksbury in England, close to Gloucester, right? Essentially, the forces loyal to the House of Lancaster were completely defeated by those of the rival House of York under their monarch, King Edward IV, right? While the Lancastrian heir to the throne, Edward, Prince of Wales, and many prominent Lancastrian noblemen were killed during the battle or executed once captured. And the Lancastrian King Henry VI of England, that meanwhile was a prisoner in the Tower of London, died or was murdered shortly after uh, the battle, as we will see. And uh, Tewkesbury fundamentally restored political stability in England until the death of Edward IV in 1483. So this is a battle video that, that is, as uh, my followers know, the uh, tactical analysis of the battle, right? Which is a, a fascinating one, right? It's after all very simple, but uh, it's also strange, right? It's also, um, you know, interesting, fascinating from one side, also frustrating from the other for, for a number of reasons we will see now, because a, a very few happened of what at least sources tell us about. Uh, the prominent one being the arrival of uh, the the history does be the title the history of the arrival of of King Edward um, IV in in England, uh, which is a Yorkist source um, written uh, a few a few time after the battle, so it's the, the the most reliable. For the rest, we have to rely, in fact, on Tudor era chronicles that surely knew something, you know. In, you know, surely they knew much more than we do today, but also provide, you know, in fact, they, they're congruent with um, the earlier ones. There are also some, you know, for example, there's the Chronicle of the Abbey of Tewkesbury. You will see now the importance also of the building during the, mostly after the battle, rather. Um, and uh, they all more or less tell you know, the, the same thing. It's just that uh, our knowledge of the battlefield, or better, the lack of, um, of information we can gather comprehensively how, how it was at the time and the position of the armies render mm, certain passages of these chronicles difficult to understand, right? As we'll see, the main deal is uh, an attack uh, through this series of lanes of hedges trenches we don't understand even concretely what is this were about we'll try to to explain uh to to make some hypothesis about it uh in the midst of, of the battlefield and with an entire division that essentially an entire band uh attack you know across the the field and that allegedly would have been you know a, a surprise or you know something uh something similar now, the battle was fought between, as we've seen, the Lancastrian and Yorkist forces that counted uh, uh, respectively um, something like uh, 6,000 and a bit, some hundred less men, right? Um, and we don't even have, in fact, the, the full figures. We know, generally speaking, that the, uh, so the, a bit of strategic background. Um, here, the background is really complicated. This um, fundamentally, the, this campaign is fought after the defeat of um, the uh, rebels, like uh, of you know, of, of war led by Warwick. After the defeat at um, Barnet in the same year, I think on April the 13th, of the um, Lancastrian forces uh, at the coming back, in fact, to to Britain of King. Uh, Edward the the fourth that had been housed by this cook back in the day and had uh, taken refuge in Flanders. Right, we had uh, received the support of Charles uh, the Bold uh, with some money, like fifty thousand uh, Florence, and eventually some, even some archivists here, some some forces uh, that we um, uh, we we don't see in the battle through the chronicles, but we know were there and surely were also present from the. Uh, from the Lancastrian side. Well, 
they had managed to retake London, right? And the uh, by managing to eluding the the, the 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 Lancastrian forces that were eventually met uh, at Barnet and crushed. Here, the, the main rebel was, was Warwick was um, cousin of Edward uh, the Fourth, but had fundamentally turned his code for political reasons. Now we we don't digress in, but uh, you know this uh, King. Um, Henry VI that had been previously imprisoned by uh, Edward IV before the coup uh, was re-put, let's say, in, in prison um, as a feeble uh, and as an enfeebled individual as, as such at that point. And however, uh, his, um, I mean, Edward's, um, uh, excuse me, Henry's uh, wife, Margaret of Anjou, and the and Prince Edward uh, had uh, just landed in in Britain, the south of Britain, to join Warwick forces. Uh, learning, I think, two days after the, the battle that he had been killed in it. So at that point, um, they had come with some forces that were now supported also by some rebels in in the north of England. Um, and Margaret initially wanted to come back to France, where she had been, uh, you know, in, in exile and being supported by. But then she was convinced by her advisors to move on and to try to join forces in Wales with Jasper Tudor, the Earl of Pembroke, that would have that had levied this, this, these troops that could make mass. So basically, the campaign of Tewkesbury is this pursuit carried out by um, Edward IV's army uh, after Margaret. Uh, a, uh, a race that, uh, let's say, uh, a chase that better that ended at Tewkesbury um, for essentially the reason that the, 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 the both both armies were exhausted. They had arrived. Um, uh, the, the, the Lancastrian one had arrived to uh, to the river Severn, right? And in that the, this important confluence with the uh, river Avon to where. Tewkesbury lays right, and they realized on the day before the battle, May the third, that um, the the Yorkist forces were too close. That uh, trying to cross the river the day after would have exposed them to, you know, they would have the risk to be attacked when they were cut in half from the two sides of the river. So uh, the Duke of Somerset, that was in, uh, the the commander of the uh, of of the Lancastrian force where Queen Margaret and Prince Edward were decided to give battle the next day. It was a sensible decision, right? Uh, things were going bad, meaning that both armies were exhausted, but let's say Edward IV had here a bit more of a moral f strength from his side. Um, the Lancastrians had uh, lost even some artillery the day before, um, you know, while it was being, you know, it was left behind and, and the Yorkists had... Uh, God in it, and this is seemingly partly, re at least hypothetically reflected, as we will see during the battle, uh, with more firepower from the Yorkists. So the battlefield is a bit the, the issue here. So in in the drawing that you will see, about it's very simple, right? Because it's literally more or less all we need to know about the battlefield, and 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 it's narrowed down to properly the area where the fight occurred. And but looking at the broader area, fundamentally, um, the um, the Yorkist forces the, the day before had encamped at Treddington, that is something like five uh, kilometers uh, south of Tewkesbury. Uh, that uh, Tewkesbury is a, you know important. Like at, at this point, our main problem is that largely the area of the battlefield has been covered in houses. Right, and mm, also the, there is the A38 that crosses the area and may have properly destroyed any evidence of what we needed to know about the area. That he that at the time seemingly was was not particularly, uh, you know, mm, you know, there, there were not particular uh, differences in height or something that would suggest what the main interpretational problem of the battle is. But that um, might have simply, you know provided with some better insight of what this battle might have gone like. And uh, th there's been some historiographical debate properly on how the armies were arrayed in this area. And uh, if you look at 
you know, here we don't have it, but essentially um, what all we know with certainty is the battle was fought in the south of Dukesbury where the, uh, the Lancastrian army had encamped. The position of the camp is not known and it, uh, it was probably in the south of, 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 the, uh, of the town itself. Um, and older historiographical interpretations wanted to stress that fundamentally the battle was fought just not very distant from uh, the the, out, the southern outskirts of the town when there, were, there, there is an important beautiful abbey inserted here in, in the pictures. Um, there are some hills, fish ponds, and also um, essentially, and this is instead what you can see from from the picture, there are two, um, two other uh, streams essentially the river uh, uh, Swillgate that flows eventually into the, the Avon that flows into the into the Severn uh, all essentially in the south west of Tewkesbury in a few you know like couple of uh, like one kilometers of just really short distances and then another one that is the the, the Colne Brook uh, that is smaller but it, it's the area that it, this also flows in the Avon south of where the this Willgate does and the area is still known today as Bloody Meadow that is what that took the name presumably where most of the Lancastrian army was massacred after after the battle um, I, I, I've looked at the because usually I, I use Google Maps with the relief um, indicator to, to look a bit at the area and I couldn't find any significant um, you know, let's say feature that I've seen that the memorial of the battle is more a bit, you know, west or mm, close to the Bloody Meadow, right? I don't know whether properly on the Colne Brook or something, it's, it's by there. Um, and um, and uh, this is more or less the area where uh, between these two, mm, these two streams that the battle was fought like. The main historiographical interpretations where the old one has been kind of debunked uh, thought that the battle was fought basically just attached to Holm Hill, the fish ponds next to the Habe, with the River Swillgate in, in the back, with the Holm Bridge um, that is a bit of a trap, like because if, if you get crushed, if the uh, the army get crushed there, you, you just have a, a lot of um, accidents in your rear. You have that can impede your 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 fleet. So um, that's probably and also it was believed that in Holm Hill there was at the time uh, a castle or any significant building which um, in archaeological uh, survey has showed to probably uh, existing not not a castle something much more modest. In fact, the 16th century sources um, um, already at the time said that, that they could see this you know, lower ruins mostly of, there was a castle mostly built like um, in the high middle ages, eventually rebuilt in the 13th, but there seemingly was n none of that uh, at the time that could serve as a sort of uh, meaningful uh, shelter fortification of, to be exploited during the battle for, as we will see mostly now, the, the Lancastrian right that you see 6,000 men, it would have been 2,000 men and you know that's not anything meaningful even just properly ex from an extensional point of view and uh, this hypothesis has been ruled out and more uh, recent uh, historiography stresses the fact that the battle might have been fought like one mile south of Tewksbury as a matter of fact which is not very far away from that place but essentially across a ridge that is not dramatically pronounced, but it's you know still meaningful to have uh, at the southern end of it uh, a slope right in uh, along the uh, the east west axis that could be a good line of defense for the Lancastrian army, and it's nothing impressive, but as we will see, might have been uh, further uh, fortified in order it may have presented some specific um, obstacles at the bottom of it that are what they seem to have existed at the time, even though we have no clear clue of what they may have been. Um, as we'll see, the, the the Yorkist army essentially marched uh, from Treddington, passing the Rivenswill Gate, marching essentially northwest towards Tewksbury, and met the Lancastrian army, 
problem, but at least this is completely like prosthetic, right? It's just the best uh, idea we have at this point. Uh, exactly in this area, and it, in the area have been uh, so basically in front of the ridge. So having actually to attack. Um, uh, so this ridge is called Gaston's, right? As in here, you can't trace it. Um, and in, with a, so a slight slope, so in, the Yorkers would have had still to to attack in a, with a slight, you know, inclination, right? Uh, above, uh, you know, above ground. Um, and in in the midst. There is a place I think still today called Gaps Hill Manor, uh, with maybe been a slight obstacle, and also an artwork known as Queen Margaret's Camp, which is being called like this because it has nothing to do with um, the Lancastrian Army Camp, in spite of the name. It was named after after Tewkesbury, um, like that in, because of Margaret of Anjou, but um, we don't even know where it was there at the time. Right, and it's like if you look at it, there is a picture in here. Um, it's like uh, it's definitely too small to be, first of all, a camp. Also, okay, we may not know how it was actually at the time, but it's hardly any major structure or whatever. It's just like a, um, you know, a, a surface surrounded by, you know, just like, um, you know, edges of, you know, of ground, etc. Nothing uh, above ground, there's nothing special but still a slight uh, a slight obstacle if it had been if it had ever been there uh, in the first place um, sources stress the fact that there were hedges lanes um, even trenches uh, in in the area also trees right so um, this would it, it, it's per a bit perplexing. First of all, the Yorkists marched from, uh, in order to reach the enemy, had fundamentally marched uh, north, right? With the both ar the armies were in between at this point the the river, the river Swillgate and the Colne Brook. So with their flanks fundamentally protected, by saying the battle would be the battlefield would be uh, shaped in in that fashion, and before. Mm, yeah, so the, the the Lancastrians were waiting for the enemy already on the at the limit of the ridge close, and so the Yorkists arrived in a in an elevated ground that is uh, called um, it, where is the stone so called Stonehouse Farm is located. I've searched it on Google Maps, but I couldn't find it. Um, and uh, so I don't know which height uh, this thing is. Uh, located and whether there is uh, a good site of the uh, of the battlefield at that point. I think I saw a, f a picture from a book I have. I think that's that Stonehouse farm um, is taken from there. I mean, and you can in fact distinctly see the Abbey of Tewkesbury, uh, and there are trees today in in the middle, right? So you can see the houses down there now. But let's say. Um, maybe the site might have been slightly impeded by that, and um, this the, the various obstacles that might have existed at the time there, even though we know that there was no major upheaval in, to destroy the ground and things like that, may have effectively obscured part of the vision. Of, so the uh, Lancastrians at the beginning of the battle were already deployed in three uh, divisions, right, that were uh, generally at this point, uh, a bit the standard um, army d deployment, right? It allowed you know enough, you know, unity of command, but also tactical flexibility, for that matter. You know, we made a video on the tactics of the Wars of the Roses, in which we explain what were the, the essentials of these battles. As you will see, these were mostly infantry fights, right? Uh, the Lancastrian um, army was mostly on foot. Uh, properly com made up of infantry and with no, not many horses. Um, he said most of the Yorkist forces were mounted, but they would dismount during the battle by English uh, habit, right? Uh, I made some videos explaining a bit why this, uh, if you want anomaly, right, by Western standards of, of in English warfare since essentially the, the, the beginning of the 14th century, mostly with the three Edwards uh, reforms and definitely 
completed with Edward III and mostly the wars against the, the Scots had brought them to dismount by by standard and this, things would reign like that during all the Hundred Years War, the Wars of the Roses and so on with this, uh, as you know, a reliance of men-at-arms and um, as the properly the heavy infantry and uh, accompanying longbowmen that were disproportionately more numerous than the, um, than the men-at-arms. Here, we, I don't think we know the... actually we know a bit the proportions. Um, I think, if I'm not wrong, from the Yorkist side we have properly the contract of of, of recruitment of 13, uh, 3,300 longbowmen, so that's yeah, also when we, they, they were at this point as, you know, probably not much more numerous than the, than the uh, men-at-arms. They were saying before the total figures for the York is something like 15, uh, 5,500. Um, so it's, the majority is, is missile, uh, Infantry, uh, longbowmen. The the same proportion was likely to be the same uh, the, to be found in, in the Lancastrian army, right? And the the, the vans were deployed usually with the right one as the vanguard properly. That was essentially, you see, the, the in column, they this would have been the, the the leading one, right? One of the place of honor. And normally, when they pass from column to line, they deployed with the with the um, with the vanguard, in fact, in on the right, right, and so uh, it was uh, in this case for the Lancastrians because the commander in chief, the Duke of Somerset, was on the right of the Lancastrian, um, of the Lancastrian uh, array, so w essentially with the uh, Colne Brook on the uh, on the on, on its right, and uh, as you see uh, as you see in the map, the Colne Brook sends in the west. Uh, the um, so the the sense of this is also that the vanguard had to be the strongest division of the army, right? The uh, Lancastrians had deployed so Somer the Duke of Somerset on the right, Prince Edward together with um, uh, Lord Wenlock uh, in the center, right? Edward w was like seventeen at this point, so and Wenlock was. Um, was that there is a lot of turn coating during the the Wars of the Roses, as you know. This was this had already been uh, had didn't have much great reputation in that sense. And during the battle, we'll see what happens. And uh, so this was the center, the one that you know, the the the, the commander in uh, at least you know what the king in this sense would, would stay the monarch, right? Usually divisions were all commanded by great noblemen of, of the kingdom, and then. The center was usually the the place of the monarch, but not necessarily the the strongest. As we've seen, the, the right was usually the strongest. And and then there was the Earl of Devon on the left, so with its left on the river Swillgate, on the ridge, on on the gas, and so overlooking the the, the, the field in the front uh, below. So the Yorkists approach and they reach Sto Stonehouse Farm with a Probably, I think that's the place where they got in sight of the enemy army. Actually, these armies knew each other, meaning that the, the various runners, explorers, they had harassed each other. As we've seen, the, they had e even managed to take the part of the, uh, the Lancastrian artillery the, the day before, uh, during the march. So, uh, uh, so th this is normal. And they would keep scouting the ground as they advanced naturally because they didn't want nasty surprises and that's how you put the, you carry out the thing safely so uh, at the so the, the the this divisions were properly formed uh, at the moment of leaving the camp red would march in column with um, banners unf uh, unfolded with men already predisposed in the way they would eventually have to rearrange in, in line with the enemy, uh, Edward the Fort was probably uh, leading uh, from the fore, me not meaning that he belonged to the band, but would run, go to his horse at that point, uh, on, you know, at the head of the formation, but was actually in charge of the center, uh, the central division. While um, the Duke of Gloucester, that would be no less than his younger brother and future Richard the Third. 
uh, that had seen some warfare uh, in the in the Barnet, also on the Scottish border, etc. Probably the, his, his command abilities have been a bit overstated, but he was still, uh, you know, a reliable uh, commander in that sense. So he had been given, as you will see now, actually the place of honor. How actually not on the right, but on the left, meaning that he was technically leading the rear guard, and then when they deployed in in um, in, uh, in column, instead then shifting the, the vanguard to the right, he was commanded by Lord Hastings, that in, at Battle Barnet uh, had seen his division crumbling, and therefore was not probably not considered that reliable. Edward um, had, uh, in fact, deployed uh, Gloucester on on the on the left, right, so in front of Somerset, and so because when the Yorkists were approaching, they would see naturally the the enemy banners declaring the position of of the commanders. This was a you know um, a normal uh, deal in feudal warfare that naturally noblemen clearly put forward in good sight their own banners so they could be recognized. So Edward thought to to achieve this because Somerset had some some reputation command and and uh, probably Edward wouldn't trust Hastings that much he would be uh, he would rely mostly on his brother and Hastings in this sense was on the right so technically that was the place of honor and this is possibly how Edward the fourth with his usual charm uh, would tell him like yes you you don't fight against the, the big guy but you still have the the right the place of honor so you know you couldn't really contest that in front of a king Edward IV was a tall guy, was like six foot three and a half, something like that, when the, his thumb was being open, was measured, and he was considered handsome in his time, he was, uh, you know, a charming man, he, he, at this point he was 29, if I'm not wrong, he had a, a good reputation among his troops, he was called, he uh, would call his knights the his, his children, but also he was very much feared as well, because he could carry out acts of unspeakable cruelty like a bit it's the you know the background of the wars of the roses in general um uns you know unspeakable brutality um but he um he was you know and and his brother richard kind of you know he had stayed loyal through all the 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 the, the, the mess that had happened uh, in years before probably also because he feared him in in some measure now, the the interesting thing is also that so at that point the the, uh, the 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 Yorkist army would form in line and would advance gradually uh, down the slow uh, down the yeah the 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 descending ground towards the Gastons. So uh, arriving at this area that had been overlooked from the above and that therefore wouldn't present many you know, many tricks, many problems. As, we, as I was saying before, I don't know how much visibility you could get from Stone, Stone House Farm, but the idea is that, you know, the Yorkists had clearly inside all the Lancastrian uh, divisions, right? So they would form, even if they were three uh, in a line, they would form kind of visually as a continuous line, also for reason of every unit has a space between one another in, in, in every army, right? For not causing domino effects for you know dividing dividing correctly the the the, the scenario and there was a good visibility in other circumstances like at Barnet there would be a thick fog um, that also procured some problems because you know, essentially the the Lancastrian army uh, the Lancastrian men at arms started killing each other at some point they called for treach treachery and panic um, ensued and the 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 wall the wall formation collapsed. This was none of that. These were this, there were hot days, right? The day before had been exhausting. Especially it was a good visibility. Was in good weather, as far as we understand. No complication in visibility at all. Um, so once again, no surprise of who would have found uh, room in uh, in in battle, practically. This is important for seeing how eventually the the, the battle actually was. To, was fought and uh, the, the, the interpretation of problems that we have. Naturally, there would be uh, some preliminary speech uh, when Queen Margaret and Prince Edward saw 
the the Yorkist army arriving, they would, you know, for right on the fore, cheering the troops up, promising them, you know, rewards, uh, loot and prestige and fame, and all these things. And a pep, typical pep talk before battle. Edward uh, also had addressed uh, his men. The arrival tells us the alleged words, quote, displayed uh, his banners, did blow up the trumpets, committed his cows and quarrel to Almighty God, to our most blessed lady, his mother, Virgin Mary, the glorious Saint George, and all the saints, and advanced directly upon his enemies. Hmm? So, you have to imagine this divisions gently moving uh, down the slopes, arriving uh, at uh, effectively at range of the enemy because there, there was artillery from both sides um, and and all those longbowmen as we were saying before. So as we were saying before, the tactics of the Wars of the Roses see this. You know, it, the Wars of the Roses were essentially dynastic struggles, right? Which the the whole elite participated. Uh, the monarchs had all this. Uh, clients of theirs that were contracted properly as with their with their retinues were men at arms with this um, other complement uh, mostly of long bowmen but naturally the word was other you know infantry pole axes with uh, staff weapons um, and and artillery right and these battles as we've seen traditionally in England were fought um, like the, the English naturally were aware of the effect of their own tactics and how they had had on the, on, on the French but this is not entirely it, like it's not just a mechanical thing. They would simply really want to aim at the uh, at the nobleman, right? They wanted to make it, even for cultural reasons, political reasons, uh, one versus, uh, like, face-to-face um, -face struggle in melee, right, between, you know, and to kill them. This is a characteristic of the War of the Roses. As all dynastic struggles, you want to take out, physically, the guy that, Prevents because if you kill that guy, you know you you're done for. In fact, uh, the Wars of the Roses, as ferocious as they were, they, they wouldn't actually care procure much devastations in England, right? They were quite the the campaigns were very brief, right? It was it's like a date, right? To say okay, let's meet on that ground. That's it. It wouldn't be a a tremendous uh, ravaging thing like the same English had carried out scorched art in, in France with the Chevalier. No, it, it was just very contained. Um, the only effect is basically a decimation of the nobility, like a bloodbath of noble blood that would also favor later on, in fact, the centralization of the of the Tudor uh, monarchy as the, the House of the Lords was <laughs> literally emptied after, after these uh, decades. Um, and uh, so it was mostly a fight carried out by the men at arms, one against each other, supported by the longbowmen, and with some preliminary uh, harassment, naturally, because you don't just go directly into fight. You want to see if you can wear them out with uh, firepower, and this is exactly, fundamentally, what what happened with 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 combat here. And we think that they arrived essentially at a range of 300 meters one from the other, and began to shoot at each other. At this point, Queen Margaret had left the army, she was in safe, some, somewhere near, she probably could see the battlefield in Tewksbury, either in the Abbey or somewhere else, um, as, you know, the distances are relatively short, right, so, but still you have to be, in fact, cautious. Another important aspect, I, I forgot, but it, it's, uh, it will be, you know, relevant for the battle, is that, um, Edward, uh, overlooking uh, the, the battlefield uh, as Stonehouse Farm, and um, I tell you what, because the arrival writes it directly, says, he, Edward, considered that upon the right hand of their field there was a park, and there ain't much wood, and he, thinking, so their field meaning the Lancastrian one, so on, on, the, on, on Edward's Yorkist left, thinking to purvey a remedy in case his said enemies had had any bushment, that is, an ambush, in that wood of horsemen he chose out of his fellowship two hundred spears and set them in a plump together near a quarter of a mile from the field, giving them charge to have a good eye upon that corner of the wood, in case that any need were, and to put them in, in the war, so in service, and if they saw none such, as they thought most behoveful 
for time and space to employ themselves in the best wise as they could. So essentially here you have 200 spears that here means something like probably horsemen actually we, we don't know it might have been just you know I have this concealed ambush uh, thing is um, you know there is no just mass to to anything military like for which it has to be just that right of course it might have been they were probably mo mostly mounted right and uh, they might have been supported by some infantry as well uh, and you have to think of you know properly uh, guards watchers all around right still on 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 the on Stonehouse farm uh, etc so that any messenger could arrive something happens the, the enemy, you, you always have to think these battles were you know are we sure that what we see is all what is out there so the reason why Edward thought of this um, in, in might have been connected to to uh, to Gloucester's leadership because uh, he was um, the, the the commander was said in, in the past to have enacted a similar trick at Battle Toto, um, and um, that wouldn't uh, effectively uh, ca be carried out. I don't, I don't remember how the, the deal is. We will talk about the Battle Toto as well, and this might have been a reason. But simply, any commander would would know like you see there is a boat here on on essentially uh, a height that in the picture of the battle here i haven't inserted you see at some point we'll, when we talk about the, the spears will pop out right from the flank so actually uh, i don't know if the arrival is is trying to a bit you know say okay well he because the the attack from the flank was ideally uh, unchivalric Right, and unchivalrous in properly in act because you know it was, as we were saying before, face to face. Right, true gentlemen would fight like that. But this thing of the concealed reserve was always there. So if the arrival says, uh, you know, that that the Edward did this for fear that actually the enemy might have been hidden there with his own concealed par party. Well, you know, it's a way of saying he wasn't really doing it because he was, you know shrewd and you know and chivalric he was just he wanted just to check right the truth is that he may have you know scientifically placed uh, those troops there f with the purpose of you know of carrying out uh, a flank attack as would ha occur during the battle uh, and it is plausible yes at the same time you might have said okay maybe the enemy has placed some troops there as well right this is always a problem of concealed parties and ambushes that yeah, you can meet the enemy, and very often, uh, when you reconstruct battle, fam very famous battles, think about, I don't know, Muret, um, or, uh, or Tagliacozzo, or Markfeld, um, all these uh, big 13th century battles in European history where you have probably the top military culture uh, solving the of the time feudal warfare solving the battle with a with a concealed flank attack you say well but why wouldn't the others use that as well part of the reason is that here we are in in the 15th century naturally so it's different but don't think that the level of documentation is dramatically uh better uh, especially in this context than just uh, you know the previous ones we say why wouldn't the, the other army do the same right and and my guess is my take is that probably Armies used to do the same thing, but almost spectacularly, right? There is also evidence in some on some occasions, just that one of the two armies won, right? And one of the two armies had the chance to carry out that flank attack, and or we don't know what the commanders did at that point because you know carrying a f out a flank attack it, it requires a very good eye, a very good coup d'oeil that is uh, not to be given for granted, right? So these two hundred spears are probably mostly horsemen. Right, also because they had to be quick. Reader says one f one quarter of a mile um, from here, presumably it's the axis of the to the distance from the yeah fr from the from the Yorkist army altogether. Because now it would proceed north. This this hill I haven't represented in the map is further west, right? Um, so uh, here at least the source tells us how far that was. We 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 can't take it for you know, for true 
percent, but still, you know, that's more or less the figure we get. And it's quite close, actually. You know, concealed uh, ambush parties would would normally be less obvious than the distance, right? Something greater. But at the same time, considering that most troops were probably not not mounted, right? They, then they probably there there even weren't around much in terms of significant. Um, tactical units there they would mostly f fight on foot at that point um, it's um, it's kind of a you know e even an easy way to spot I mean we don't know what the Lancashians actually thought of that if they had spotted that that place if they feared any flank attack etc I, I already promised you that according to me the battle went in much more messed up way than the Okamian legitimately Okamian way of you know of, of interpreting it in, is right, but the, the fact is according to me that this battle is not particularly well documented. That is probably went in a much more confused way that that it, than we know, right? And the fact that we have such low amount of information doesn't mean that that's literally all what happened, right? This is the great problem in the myth mythology of uh, in the method of properly reconstructing battles. I made a video about this, by the way, how to reconstruct a medieval battle. Uh, it's in the Easter Rain playlist that can give some, some hint on this. Um, in any case, that was a good thing, as we will see also from how the battle unfold to have moved those 200 spears uphill just to see what, what was going on. It was also an elevated ground, so that from there they could l overlook the the, the battlefield and seeing what was going on and spotting the, the best moment for for attack right so as we were saying here we're 6,000 versus 5,500 roughly right and um, they would the, the two sides the, the Yorkist army would have advanced without losing cohesion gradually considering that they had already marched some kilometers so it's in in, in armor right in in battle array so that's not a few right these men were well trained to properly distribute their energies ergonomically without you know they knew how to control their their breath their you know their pace etc everything was measured in that way both armies were kind of tired from from the long marches of the day before uh the days before um so that has to be counted but you know they closed in at extreme bow shot, right, so 300 yards, and the guns were slewed into position. This was done how? It's a bit like the, you know, the history of, um, you know, of the mitraille and uh, the birth of machine guns, right? You know, in military history, artillery is placed uh, at a distance that fundamentally escapes uh, the uh, the, the 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 troops handgun fire here it's mostly there were hand hand gunners that we were saying before uh, but they were mostly longbowmen so what's the deal you de you deployed artillery exactly at the limit of longbow range because at that point you know that you you can you, you increase accuracy you increase uh, the power of the projectile but you don't risk your crew being taken out by longbow shots right. And also, if the enemy approaches, you're essentially shooting at a point point blank range, right? But or at least, and or at least consider that the work the, the work canister, the were specific that mitraille already existed, right? Because mitraille here was used, in fact, mostly against the approaching enemy to create this enormous gap. So at this point, like 15th century artillery wouldn't create in this proportional number, but still the psychological effect. Of seeing, I don't know, a, a man at arms that is literally the best thing uh, you can see on a battlefield, literally blown up, you know, guts spilled, spilled everywhere, like torn to pieces by a single cannon shot. It's definitely, you know, not pleasant nor, uh, you know, heartwarming, let's say. And so it, it was a thing. So the, the, the reason here was naturally wearing each other out. So the, the side that uh, had the initiative and that here was pursuing in the first place from the strategical and this is reflected in the tactical thing naturally the the Yorkists uh, ha were confident that they they had uh, superior firepower as it seems it had 
to have really uh, been the case. In fact, they were confident it would, if if the Lancastrians had not attacked eventually, uh, they would have s had the, the worst of, of this engagement. Naturally, they wouldn't think to take each other out just by gun, fire, longbow uh, shots. Uh, this was just a preliminary thing, right? Both things didn't have the power to knock out each other's armies, right? It was all up to the heavy infantry. And so, as, as far as we understand, the... Uh, like I think all divisions of the army began to shoot at each other more or less at the same time, right? The sources uh, says that the guns uh, began to roar and the archers loosed off quote to write a sharp shower, right? And uh, the arrival speaks ex explicitly of the king's ordinance, right? It may mean that most of of the guns were in the center possibly to say, okay, if, if we knock in the, the, the royal division in front of us, so the one when Prince Edward was, you know, if that would have been, you know, probably from a moral point of view, the, the greatest blow, right? So that was a way to put greater pressure. Probably, if that had been the case, probably the Lancastrians would have done the same because a random sh uh, cannon shot that, that kills maybe Edward at the time, it's always a risk, right? These men are really risking all individually on, on, on the fight. Longbow shot is is also, like, plate armor. At this, Essentially, these English men at arms were all covered in Italian armor with some some German, uh, let's say, uh, features in it that were spreading, let's say, there were also Flemish armor. These were mostly the, the centers of production at the time. And the men at arm, covered in full plate armor from head to toe, was relatively safe, at least from longbow shot. But you have to consider that concentration of arrows is always like splinters, things, and anything can go wrong, let's say. It's just, and it's just annoying properly to be under arrow fire in the first place. Right, it's just you don't take out men at arms with longbows, right? This is not. It's always a combined tactic. So you ha you need the men at arms doing most of the job, right? And this, they don't deserve too much credit. Whether you like it or not, any missile weapon doesn't matter if it's a longbow, crossbow, whatever. It's just an accompanying weapon, fundamentally, right? Uh, battles are won by heavy cavalry, by heavy infantry, factually, and the um, so. There, there was also, we, we don't know much about the, the, the details of this exchange. Mm -hmm. We don't know also the, the proportions, as we were saying before. We presume that the, um, the actually the, the Lancastrians were, in general, uh, less uh, fire powerful because the, the arrival notes that they had n not so great plenty. It doesn't specify what, whether of 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 guns, or longbow, and or simply of projectiles. By the way, because that might have been of shots and arrows, you know, whatever they they cost. That those are the ones that effectively cost the most, actually, and also to bring it logistically and so on. So, however, we understand that we're getting the worst of the duel. As w as far as we understand, both sides had hand gunners. Uh, no source specifies it for the Lancastrians, but it would be typical in, in an army of that time. And not, not in a great proportion, surely in a, you know, in concrete minority compared to the longbow meant that in England would remain like a thing, properly en masse, still by the mid-16th century, be before becoming definitely anachronistic. But... Uh, uh, it's just that we know that the Burgundians had sent some troops to some hand gunners to Edward the Fourth, so probably they were there because why not in the first place? But I can't stress enough how naturally, like during the dynastic struggle within Englishmen, of course, these armies, these armies were homogeneously English, right? So they were like the same, in organically speaking, aside from here the, you know, more or less. Like, even cavalry here was snobbed fundamentally, so that, as we've seen, the, the, the Yorkists had more, but they would still fight on foot. So it was the typical English 
versus English struggle of the Wars of the Roses. Some mercenaries might have been there for, for sure, right? Those Burgundian hand gunners, for example, I don't know, there were Germans, there were, you know, lots of people from different countries in Europe, but still, most of these were, if, if anything, the, like, the troop of of uh, in the retinues of uh, of these um of this nobleman these men at arms that indentured their that were indentured and that they would hire with this means to you know whoever they found in the market that's basically it so at this point there is the not so clear uh event that effectively made the battle per se as far as we understand it however we don't we don't know much about especially relatively to the ground right this information comes from the arrival right that says about the duke of somerset so in the front uh, like uh, in on the right of the lancastrian army so um we are talking about a uh, armies that normally fought frontally against each other you understand here the simplicity of it in the uh, in the european middle ages armies are usually symmetric right there can be this favoritism as we've seen about the place of honor and all this stuff because there was an an, an intrinsic order of course one division uh, that there was always a division that was more or less important than the other right but here we see and we see the right one being the, the most important even though the kings were in the center one, central one so this is why it's striking because because um the somerset had gloucester in front of him right instead the arrival says that somerset advanced himself with his fellowship somewhat aside hand the king's edward the fourth's van and by certain paths and ways therefore before pervade and to the king's party known he departed out of the field passed the lane and came into a fair place or close even before the king where he was embattled and from the hill that was in one of the close the, uh, one of the closes he sat right fiercely upon the end of the king's battle Right, so this is really a problematic uh, thing because we don't understand clearly what the hell happened. Um, I would like to stress the arrival had described the battlefield in such way: before them and on every hand, full lanes and deep dikes and many hedges with hills and valleys, a right evil place to approach as could have been devised. Now, as we were saying before, even if the ha if the if the houses have concretely covered the area and probably much of what, you know, what, what was like in 1471, we can't really reconstruct concretely. There doesn't seem to be such a dramatic uh, terrain unevenness to to justify like you know, there were hidden paths, right? So we were saying before, uh, these armies had seen each other. The, they they knew what they were about. They had recognized each other in front, and they would fight on a ground that that they had fundamentally established because you know the Lancastrians had picked the field waiting for the Yorkists who had get accepted battle and they were arrayed in that in that fashion because they, they had recognized the enemy formation so what could there be in, in between these two armies that would you know generate some such a complicated uh, scenario in terms of maneuvers and hidden uh, you know this this kind of macabre hide and seek thing that you know you see the uh, Somerset passing literally the, by the side of the king's van according according to the source this this is pretty 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 strange and this is the main problem with the battle reconstruction because we don't have fundamental we will see that the uh, 16th century Tudor sources say something that may a bit unlock this style and it is the, the in favor the interpretation but it's still not clear how uh somerset alone here we we could think the entire division would attack you know at that point in in a diagonal axis the the the, the enemy center so not attacking gloucester in front but attacking on the side right so 
there are many considerations that are all kind of hypothetical because we don't know about obstacles obstacles of the terrain right so we can assume that first of all um, what kind of flank attack you know what room what margin of maneuver would you have had properly to carry out a, a, an outflanking of the king's division in a where and not right it it seems impossible right now the, the ground could afford that because a division here it's 2000 men right even if the men at arms were the the minority they were still in the in the hundreds at least several hundreds if not maybe 1000 per each and therefore you don't hide such a mass of men covered in in steel um, you know like you know, marching on the battlefield that you have already seen is not huge, it's just, you know, there, right? And that manages to, to not just to outflank the enemy uh, central division, but in this sense, eluding, in a sense, or uh, however, not caring particularly about the one of, of, of Gloucester, that is the one that they would have, have to find themselves in the front end by outflanking uh, the center, so coming on... And it's, uh, in that sense, we would have exposed in turn their own flank, right, to the uh, uh, Yorkist left. This is not easy to understand because we literally don't know anything about the field. We don't know, uh, we don't have any information about how these armies were arrayed. Military logic tells us that more or less it, it was, the thing should have been simpler than, than it seems, right? Um, here the source also doesn't quite say that King Edward was kind of surprised by this maneuver. This doesn't say that the Yorkists were not expecting this move or they were su surprised by it, right? Or these guys literally came out of nothing. It's just that th there were these hidden paths that the, the Yorkists wouldn't know fundamentally uh, that uh, could r that would allow the Lancastrians to reach Edward's division, right, and and take a f uh, pick up a fight with him. N uh, says literally passing aside hand the king's van, but he also says something departing out of the field. Right. So if you read this without outer context, you would think that you know there is a field where they fight, and then these guys come out of that field. Where, where, how, right? You know there aren't forests around like there are maybe tree lanes there are these hedges there are um, you can't imagine but it's normal for for a medieval battle especially in england this is this seems to be something recurrent even during the english civil war these these battlefields are are, are hardly ever like smooth there, there are always um uh, stone walls farms um orchards things like these and you know that's normal by a certain standard, but so what? What did actually happen? We we don't really understand. We just understand though that Somerset naturally wanted to attack Edward, right, to get over with it by killing him and finishing the, the battle uh, like that, right? And this in general doesn't speak very much in favor of the Lancastrian situation, because we have seen, first of all, they were being chased strategically. They decide to stop and say, okay, we can't, let's, uh, we can't give, uh, let's give up the, the, the chase because these guys have reached us, so they're not already in the best of situations. They deploy in a defensive position, naturally. They choose this uh, higher ground above the gas, and so that should provide them some defensive position, but they start getting uh, the worst of the uh, sh uh, shot uh, exchange, so uh, the Somerset is is forced to attack, so to calm down, apparently, because here we have no clear information of whether the Yorkists had attacked up a ridge, up slope, the the Lancaster, and so if they were the ones that, as logic here would mostly say, because they they were the ones that had the the greater moral force they had the initiative they were the ones that had to attack to 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 assault properly the the slope and the the enemy line over it so that's another thing to consider right and in fact part of the reason why i believe that um the thing is more messed up as we'll see now is that probably this fight had began well, what the sources um do not really say is that 
uh, as that that the hero passed from the 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 sh the, ex the, sh uh, the shots exchange to just uh, the information that Somerset attacked. But what do we know that? that maybe Somerset hadn't already fought with Gloucester at this point, or that uh, Hastings uh, hadn't been fighting with Devon, or that uh, Prince Edward uh, division commanded by Lord Wenlock had, wasn't engaged already with King Edward's one, and that you know how these battles occurred, right? They they fought they each other for like 30 seconds, and then they would distance again the lines would go back and forth uh, with some you know they would go on for hours right like that and there would be times in which you know one division would be me were was more tired than the other another was repulsed was retreated had suffered losses others had broken and were reforming so it's it's that messed up and of course naturally if in between you have hedges um trees whatever and maybe this other this other even trenches because we'll understand now probably there was there was some um, some kind of structure in between that might have been uh, we have seen it in more or less contemporary battles the Battle of Molinella we made in in August right we see that it was it, it, they were terribly messed up also because the 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 protagonists of these clashes were the men at arms and the men at arms like we we have this idea of order. Right, that we mostly attribute to the to the most professional element of the army. It's, it's not always like that, right? It's like, um, like of course, cohesion was maintained at so many levels, but technically, a minute arm is designed to be a solo guy, right? If he wants, because he's so well protected that, and he's so well drilled and equipped and armed, and and he's uh, one of the single most traumatically violent people you can ever meet from a psychophysical point of view compared to our own standard that 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 guy is designed to go out there and spilling blood and cutting down people like as if you know you know nothing happened like drinking a glass of water and doing it alone right so in 15th century warfare we act in this kind of what has been correctly um, you know defined Contrarily to all the positivistic bias that we get from the idea of the modern age, the Renaissance, as a refeudalization in Western warfare, because men at arms, definitely, and especially in these northern European contexts, right? You know, they were, you know, that the aristocracies were very strong. Middle classes were in this dramatic, um, you know, power in in political and social balance. Here, effectively, as we see, it's also a dynastic clash, right? These are essentially aristocrats with their private retinues that kill each other. Right, so that's what those battles were, and therefore, this idea of almost um, like a game, right? Remember that the, the war is, is a game for these people. Like there is no difference for them between civilian or military. It doesn't exist at this time for for them. It, they just have to fight because that's the, what they've been bred for and trained for all their lives. Right, so this this idea also of bravados of you know uh, assaulting in in, in 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 especially with a broken terrain with a terrain that that offers some capacity naturally in the small unit tactics to hide and seek to surprise the enemy to to make this um, individualistic act uh, is is uh, you know kind of fitting the idea that yes edward at some point may have would have you know surrounded we by Thickly packed bodyguards of men at arms. So that you know, the, the, the king, the freaking king, right? You know, uh, and this this wouldn't be that different from the other noblemen, especially the noble. But these were all relatives, by the way, in a way or in another. They were royal blood. They um, they 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 would fight in the same way. So it's not strange that they may have found each other like that. So it may be possible that um, uh, the that. Um, Somerset's division wasn't quite maybe even entirely engaged in this clash. Maybe part of it was still fighting with Gloucester. And he just Somerset in person with some but you know, in with a consistent part of his army, right? Okay, not just thirty guys, fifty guys, but you know, some hundreds may have decided to attack specifically um the king's one. Or and or if we want to be more logical in general, of course the division's nature was the one of attacking en masse, so the, the more the better, so we can't legitimately also think that it was the entire division was attacking. But this idea of the, of the 
let's say of the hidden path in at a few hundred meters of distance right with knowing perfectly what what the the main tracks of the of of the enemies there are unmasked and where it, it cannot really be like wh where do they go <laughs> is there a wormhole that <laughs> they can you know uh disappear and reappear magically so it doesn't quite fit much of, you know properly physical logic I, w I would say um given given the circumstances in any case um sources clearly state that a very fierce fight broke out between Edward's bodyguards and uh, Somerset's troops. Uh, Olin's head that is uh, one of the Tudor sources says that um, Gloucester contributed eventually to you know the pushing back of Somerset's attack that will fall back essentially. We, we don't know um, in fact, whether it was just Edward's troops or whatever, but here it's already highlighted how, of course, there was an exposure of such uh, a flank, uh, you say, a side attack. Let's say, let's not say flank, because here objectively the source doesn't say that. It's, it says from, from, from a side of, 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 the, of the king's band, so we don't understand whether it was just like a well, only one section where they thought the king was uh, uh, specifically or it was something on a larger scale in, involving the wall divisions etc. We just know that eventually Somerset was um, defeated and had to fall back right in collapse. And uh, the um, we are not told so this should have happened fundamentally in, on the left of Edward's division we don't know what was happening between between Hastings and Devon we have literally no info right we have to presume as I was saying for it's likely the worth the whole line was was saying combat at some some level uh, Holland said and Hall so this Tudor the Tudor chroni uh, production gives some different account which is, I think, very interesting to understand better the thing of the hidden path through which Somerset carried out the attack against Edward. Um, and um, the and 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 uh, Hall states specifically that the Duke had quote trenched. Um, so the Duke of Somerset, that was in command of the wall Lancastrian army trenched his camp, so the one of the Lancastrian army altogether, round about of such an attitude, and so strongly that his enemies, by no means facile, could make an entry. Right? So, this presumably refers to the camp that was set up the previous night. Naturally, these armies built a camp where they stopped, right, and we don't know where this was built. So, the idea could be that wherever also the battle was fought, because we're not even sure, however, that the Lancastrian position was somewhat exploiting during the battle, in part at least, some fortification, maybe properly the ones of the camp that had been uh, built before. So, naturally, this, were, this wasn't like a castle, right? But at the same time, you know, field fortifications at this point are, you know, medieval armies carry out pretty impressive fit, you know, that they were, these were professional armies, they they knew their deal, right, so uh, it, it's interesting and plausible that um, an army that is defending would exploit this very typical 15th century warfare uh, altogether, right, and especially in such a dimension where a few cavalry was present, in the first place, etc., to use field fortifications. The, the, the English, in general, if, if you look at during, during the Hundred Years' War, were, were famous, right, for, you know, s placing, you know, these balls on the ground, you know, to render life more difficult to the enemies, having to get literally through these, um, these defenses, trenches, things, so, so they had sappers, they had engineers, pioneers, but all, you know, they were capable of building up something more consistent. So, and and uh, Olin's head says that when the battle began, 
it was not possible to come to hand-to-hand -hand fighting because of all the obstacles that existed. So this also matches with the arrival, from which surely these sources drew in general because we're aware, but again, mostly the time the Tudor sources were written, naturally it was, you know, battles like the one of Tewksbury were remembered, it was some, some, some memory in general, uh, uh, voices, uh, other, other works, by the way. That um, that confirmed thus this this idea of of, of an um, you know a, a accidented ground that might have been rendered even more uh, uneven and difficult to cross because of fortifications. Right. Hull notes uh, first an attack by Gloucester's division with guns, bows, or hand weapons is not specified. Though his battle, his division, quote, assaulted the trench of the Queen's camp, whom the Duke of Somerset would no less courage defend. Now, this is a hell of, a, of an information, because it tells us what was happening, essentially, between Somerset and, and Gloucester, so on the west side of the battlefield, one in front of the other, the right Lancastrian and... Uh, and the, 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 the left Yorkist divisions, Vance battles, whatever you want to call them, uh, to fighting altogether. So this would mean a lot because you, you already understand how it could be, that the problem could be solved in part. I mean, where was Gloucester? Why Somerset was attacking Edward, according to the arrival? Well, you know, from 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 the from Hull, we get that Gloucester might have already carried out an attack on Somerset's position, which, as we were saying before, it's normal. It was the Yorkists who were attacking the Lancastrian arm, strategically. So they were the ones who, you know, the Lancastrian was saying, sitting there saying, come and get us. And they, they would have had, the Yorkists would have attacked in some way. And it's possible, very possible, very likely, very plausible, realistic, that the Lancastrians were entrenched somewhere. They were properly, they had prepared a camp in function of the, the the following day's battle, right? And so you can imagine uh, trenches, palisades, things like these. So we, uh, as we've seen over the gas, and so this the slope that is still some some kind of obstacle. Consider all the the difficulty, right? The, the exhaustion of of the fights in general, in full, in full plate armor over over the slope i mean it, it's not easy right it's already very exhausting by uh, by stand where it even was a f complete flatland which is never hard it's hardly ever the case um you can imagine in this situation and with the heat with the tiredness the tension the adrenaline the, the mental pressure more than else because that's what wears you out the most right so aside from other interpretations here there is no need to to make other hypotheses, like as we were saying before, the so-called Queen Margaret's camp, that may fit. You say, ah, you see, th there is this this artwork that was called her, uh, Queen Margaret's camp. Maybe it was the Lancastrian uh, fortification. Well, we don't even know what it was there at the time of the battle. We don't even know uh, what was built later, whatever. And in any case, it, it's it's not a big thing, right? You can't. It, first of all, it's like a like a square or circle, right? It, it's a limited surface, and uh, it's like like an uh, a fence, right, of some sort, right? It's a, like a perimeter. It's not a, a path, right? It's not a a, um, a lane. It's not something you're getting through to 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 appear somewhere else, right? And in any case, it's it's small, right? In this, you know, the attack of Somerset was probably carried out en masse, right? So again. Um, even if there had been trees or other trenches, whatever, uh, you don't really hide all these people. What may have happened is that um, Somerset troops may have exploited a trench. This is a uh, an idea. Like we we have no information. This is completely hypothetical, but it may be that maybe between you know after maybe Gloucester. Um, um, had attacked these fortifications and hadn't managed 
to to break through them so at that point his men were resting or maybe had been pushed back some way so uh, we don't know about this it may have happened it, it does happen right in battles like yes entire uh, divisions can collapse and maybe some of the troops can can come back at a time it does happen especially when there is another um, uh, force that backs, uh, backs them up or has remained fighting there so they can rejoin it um, so it might have been at that point that maybe it not necessarily even maybe Gloucester simply you know f fell back and uh, recovered forces again these battles lasted hours right uh, this one wouldn't be particularly long as we understand um, but we don't have to be tricked by the simplicity of it to say okay yes it, you know it just was you know a few movements it ended like that you know that's just an impression because we don't have enough information but if we had seen this battlefield um and what actually occurred at that point we would have been very much amazed as if you know from the beauty if we could do any, something like that and like a time travel but properly to 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 picture sometimes the reality of warfare from like for this dim collectively dimensional and, and 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 spatial dimension that we often overlook not just the violence of it that after all is the, the banal aspect of it that just people overlook in general but you know this one say oh it must have been man so devastating yeah but you know warfare is about this moral and collective dimension you have to to see how these things happen so it might have been a thing that in this very you know articulated perimeter of trenches of ditches palisades forest lanes whatever yes there was I don't know some hundreds went some hundred men that suddenly in, in a situation we don't understand even but maybe I don't know when were Edward's troops maybe were, were already engaged and or and this is also the problem because as we'll see they should have been fighting against the the, the guys in the front but as we will see now there is also another detail that tells us that not necessarily that this may not have happened but that at least in the moment in which uh, Somerset attacked there was no um, uh, help from um, and therefore I don't know it's, it's like a blitz right you launch these guys against the the king that you have spotted there with his banner with his insignia and all because again that was quite clear and this attack is launched in a somewhat, you know, un, um, you know, in fact, uh, in, in, it's not a non-frontal one. Why? Because of course, also the trenches of this fortification would have not been a corridor, you know, going, you know, in perpendicular to the the line of battle, because that would have could have channeled an enemy attack. No, they they went from east to west. They went in parallel to the line. So they might have been built in a way that could afford maybe this. Uh, f side attack maybe who knows maybe King Edward had placed himself instead in his section of the line forward he had maybe stormed successfully some some trenches and or uh, we don't know we just don't know and then the, the and then Somerset you know took it from the flank by passing another trench we don't know we don't know um, again th the broader reconstruction so the battle usually um, stress the this which is military logical okay it, it's how we should see the thing first of all this the idea that there are these three major divisions that have mostly to operate against one another if, if you look at what they are concretely that they're just footmen that are contending a perimeter essentially so in order to cope with the uh, obviously irreconcilable information provided especially by the arrival of, of this hidden pass you the only way you can make it fit with that in an equally military logical way saying you know this this movement ha actually happened in a smaller on a smaller scale unit of some sort uh, which is possible right not all like 2,000 men or slightly less from the, the Edward Central Division were around the king Right, these men will, will operate in different, in different subunits, right? About which we also know relatively few, but we know it was the case, right? And they would operate kind of autonomously on the field. There was also a lot of competition, of bravado, of, of 
you know, say, okay, oh, look, I am the strongest. It was a ferocious competitor. Consider that also, I don't know, together with Edward was his uh, brother, was Clarence that uh, had betrayed him back in the day, had actually uh, ins reinstalled uh, Henry VI uh, after Warwick's coup. Uh, the same was with Wenlock in Wenlock in the, in the Central Division with Prince Edward uh, that, that passed for a, for a betrayer. So uh, there were presumably other people that had switched sides during the previous years and things like these. So it, it's really like we we wouldn't understand it if morally in that sense of how this could reflect even in the fight. And how individual groups would behave, and how they would need to to go on with the struggling, you know, properly um, covering a certain role more than more than else, right? This is particularly important to understand. And more we don't know, really, we don't know more about this all. And in any case, the most important thing is that um, that uh, Somerset's attack failed right it was pushed back right and uh we don't know uh much about the uh the who was whether it was mostly edwards or gloucester's or both's uh merit in any case it's uh, quite likely that it, it at this point the 200 spears that edward had concealed uh, up in the hill, uh, the the west of his position, on the, the left of his position, were employed with important important uh, result because at that point you have properly a substantial mass of troops that are involved in in, in combat, right? So they can't defend themselves. There, as we've seen, there is a single line. We don't know how deep the armies were. We don't have this information. We could make a quick map like if you look if we measure the battlefield but uh, it's not even important because normally you know really human groups the, that thickly packed actually occupy a much narrower space than we usually think uh, in any case um, that's when the troops are grappled all together in combat that's when you launch a flank attack from this concealed reserve uphill that could spot the, 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 mo the, the moment this is particularly important also because it's probably mounted force. So this can not only arrive with the obvious psychological effect that the cavalry charge can carry out. These are probably not ultra heavy cavalry in, in Italian or Gothic armor that smash like hell, like you know, the, the greatest power we could find in a battlefield at that point. Oh, these are probably like even modest agile cavalry but what what matters is their psychological impact on on a formation that is is committed in, in, in a fight and understands that there is, where are these guys coming from and, and 200 cavalry men are, are not just a few right they they can perform well the job and given that uh, as far as we understand at least you know surely there was some mounted force around there were some guys on horseback to were going back and forth, spying on Iran, etc. But we don't have any information of cavalry for both sides involved in, in the main in the main line. So those were very good for chasing and cutting down like grass all the fugitives. Because as far as we understand, the Somerset battle simply collapsed at this point and they began to flee. And the fa fact that as we've seen in the northwest of the battlefield alongside the Colin Brook, uh, the, the 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 place, the top of them and bloody meadow, actually appears, is uh, quite uh, you know it commenced by itself. That's where probably the slaughter took place. Um, there is, um, at um, so, yeah. Another thing I didn't add, but it's important in general, is that. Uh, some historian, but it's mostly just like a criticism. And most historians say, okay, Somerset mostly attacked because he wanted to silence the Yorkist guns, or and or close like because of they were getting the worst of the from from the longbow shots or the guns, etc. This is 
like, um, yeah, it's realistic. From one side, as we were saying before, it's most of what we understand from the arrival, even if it, it is not explicit about that, because it, it nowhere states that Somerset attacked because of that. It just follows in the in the in the in the text, and that's where where you have to be flexible and open-minded to say, okay, but is there really a logical connection beyond any doubt? No. Um, if you consider this this entrenchments and so on, that makes it less likely, though, because in a sense you can't even at that point you wouldn't even clearly see what the enemy guns are in or to to make an assessment in the in the broader mess of what what is actually going on, right? Another thing that I couldn't really grasp at this point is is the disposition of archers that, as we've seen, were probably the you know were numerically superior to the men at arms were located, because if they were stationed on the flanks of the men at arms in, in, in each single division, they may have uh, properly. Uh, Increased in a sense the the gap between the, the men at arms from 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 the various divisions because you would have essentially light infantry like a longbow and they cannot stand their ground against uh, the heavy one that's the definition between you know heavy and light infantry in the first place and this would you know second a bit better at least it would stress the fact it was more distance between the division the core of the divisions and uh, allowing an attack by Somerset. Right, so not just a huge rectangle like I made here in, in the map, but something, let's say, more, in fact, like a, uh, a handful of back uh, units that can that, that have that critical mass and operate together. And that would also explain now maybe the, the problem that occurred with coordination of these divisions, about which we also don't know uh, much, right? In in any case, um, we uh, was we, un we there is another episode that Hollinshed and Hall tell that is how Somerset reacted to the lack, in fact, of support from the Central Division during the attack on Edward um, One, so that he would go to his its commander, Lord Wenlock, who was you know commanding it. And standing immobile at that point, he railed at him, called him a traitor, and then in a fury he swung his axe and brained him. Right, and uh, this Wenlock, as we see, was already, you know, uh, the arrival simply states that Wenlock was among the dead, without uh, info about this episode, but th there is the sense that. Um, there was a lack of coordination, maybe some, but the, the, what betrayal, yes, could could happen in this sense. Uh, at some point, it's not to, to great use, I would say, for, for Wenlock in the first place, but it might have been partly for this. In any case, we can't know, we can't, we can't tell concretely. Uh, this may be just like maybe a tutor writer trying to stress that there was something wrong going on uh, with the Lancastrian, you know, they say that would prevent the Lancastrians from winning, but uh, it's still, mm, uh, you know, interesting because it 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 shows the the important interconnection that existed between the various battles during during the fight, and that m might have not worked. And again, we don't understand, like if if that there was this hidden path, right? According to the arrival, though, through which Somerset passed. Well, how, what was concretely the chance to, to to see a support there? Like, well, how many troops again were involved? We don't know, right? For through which paths, through which coordination? If there, there was also a lack of visibility of some sort, right? How could this interplay with the the coordination? We don't know. We don't know really. In any case, what happened, quite, quite simply, is that at the collapse of the Lancastrian right wing, fundamentally, the rest of the line began to, to waver. At least um, we understand that Edward advanced towards 
the enemy center again uh, I, I mean again I mean, we don't know but probably th there had already been some engagement we, we don't know actually the same thing we think happened on the right uh, of the Yorkist formation with Hastings against the Earl of Devon but we have no information about this so basically the Lancastrian army collapsed altogether as we've seen probably most of Somerset's the um, uh, troops fled on, on uh, like north northwest trying to cross it that because they wanted to cross the Severn for for safety right and they uh, many of them died uh, in the in the in the fording there is a fort still in fact today properly after the confluence with the Avon uh, where probably their water kind of you know flows you know uh, kind of gets bit down and then the 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 current is stronger downstream so that's the good point for the fording others were cut down properly on the on the on the left bank on bloody meadow others fled north towards Tewkesbury and towards also uh, no, not a very because there, there is there, there are fish ponds there is also the river uh, Swillgate uh, there's a bridge there that eventually leads to, to Tewkesbury there's literally there right it, it's they're very short distances I could tell you like like here from the Gastons probably to to the Abbey it's something like I think one kilometer like n yeah something like that right so it's it's really right, it's relatively close right and there are there are a few obstacles in be in the between uh, but uh, as we will see many managed to escape to the Abbey hoping to find essentially a you know safe heaven there because they thought that the place would have not been desecrated by violence. Instead, things actually, you know, went the other way around, as far as, as we understand. Um, so, uh, in the meanwhile, naturally, butchery ensued. The arrival says that Prince Edward was taken while fleeing towards the town and slain in the field. Right? And uh, actually, all sources... Uh, are you know uphold the this view um, also Warkworth that had Lancastrian sympathies describes the prince as being slain in the field while crying for succor to his brother-in-law who was the Duke of Clarence uh, the brother of uh, Edward IV and there is also uh, in 1473 uh, Varin Swords in uh, that is the Histoire de Charles, Dernier Duc de Bourgogne, that um, albeit uh, uh, the Edward died in the field, according to him, other sources stated that he was disarmed and struck across the face by Edward the same with a sword, followed by everyone. Right? The, there was probably some some mythology about this event because it was naturally the killing of the, the Prince of Wales, the, the contending to the throne. For example, Hall and Olinshead as tutors assert that King Edward offered an annuity of 100 pounds for life to anyone who could bring him the prince either alive or dead, <laughs> so uh, quite eloquently. Um, uh, and in general, you know, however, for the prince's life to be saved actually, um, and Sir Richard Crofts, that was a valiant knight that mistrusting nothing, uh, brings uh, the prisoner to Edward, who demands him to to uh, to, to to his o omnium. Why he came into his kingdom with banner displayed, right? Because that was the great uh, affront. In fact, the prince replied spiritedly and Edward pushed him away or struck him with his gauntlet and the wretch youth was uh, eventually martyred by uh, Gloucester, Dorset and Hastings. Mm -hmm. So as many took um, uh, refuge in, in the Abbey including Somerset by the way 
and uh, we don't know exactly what happened there. We just know that um, Edward finally approached the Abbey to give thanks for his victory. And the arrival uh, speaks of a general pardon. It says he gave them all his free pardon, albeit there neither was nor had not at any time been granted any franchise to that place for any offenders against their prince having recourse thither. But that it had been lawful to the king to have commanded them to have been drawn out of the church and had done them to be executed as his traitors, if so had been his pleasure. And then later on writes, he granted the corpses of the said Hedward and others so slain in the field or elsewhere to be buried there in the church or, or elsewhere as it pleased the servants, friends or neighbors without any ordering or defoiling their bodies by settling up uh, at any open place. Workworth actually s says something else, right? That Edward entered the abbey carrying a sword in his hand and was faced by a priest, quote, that turned out of it, uh, at his mass and the sacrament in his hands. And the account goes on and says about uh, the priest required him by the virtue of the sacrament, that he should pardon all those whose names here follow. The Duke of Somerset, Lord of St. John's, because there was the prior of the, hospi of the hospital years with, um, with Prince Edward's um, uh, reign, and he was killed, actually. Um, uh, Sir Humphrey Oldley, Sir uh, Gervais of Clifton, Sir William uh, Graham might be uh, grammed by, I don't know it's pronounced, excuse me, uh, Sir William Carey, Sir Thomas Tresham, Sir William Newber, uh, Knights, Harry Tresham, Walter Courtenay, John Flory, Lewis Miles, Robert Jackson, James Gower, James Delwis' son, and heir to Sir John Delwis, which, upon trust of the king's pardon, were uh, pardon given in the same church, the Saturday abode there still, when they might have gone and saved their lives. Um... So basically, he he had promised them to safety. They they stayed there and trying, by the way, to slip away in the meanwhile if they could. Also, the chronicle of the Tewkesbury Abbey um, tells a similar story. Essentially, the Yorkists entered the abbey armed and killed several of those sheltering inside, while others sacked the building and the town. So, as a consequence, on May the thirtieth. The abbey had to be consecrated again because of the bloodshed by bishop uh, by the bishop of Worcester. Uh, similar violence happened at the church of Didbrook, that was ten miles away, because you imagine many were escaping through through Tewkesbury, through other places, and so there were six thousand men. Uh, there were no figures about the losses, by the way. So it's obvious that from the Doncastrian side it must have been high, right? And uh, we can I don't know I don't know even what how much we can uh, quantify these uh, concretely. I think uh, two thousand dead is is realistic considering that so many had been properly hunted down. And that would be, uh, considering properly the, the the magnitude of the defeat in itself, I think it's realistic. Um, naturally, many others felt prisoners. Because, by the way, operations continued. Now, uh, uh, the story went, eventually, uh, Edward secured, because there were others that were still Jasper Tudor out there, there were other rebellions in the north. Um, in any case, the victory brought to, uh, to the consolidate, to the final consolidation of, of of the Yorks for for a while up to, and uh, they you know how things went eventually with Richard the Third after Edward's death. Uh, however, Henry the Sixth also was killed uh, shortly afterwards. We were surely you know psychophysically debilitated, and the story goes. Uh, Edward said that you know he had just died of you know displeasure because of the death of his son, etc. Margaret of Anjou actually, after some time, uh, to, after the battle, she had managed to escape. She let um, she let uh, Edward uh, know that she was at his full disposal, right? And uh, however, Henry VI was probably assassinated uh, by Gloucester. 
taken out. Well, these are all details that have nothing to do with the battle, but I mean, you know, that's what followed concretely. And this is basically the Battle of Tewksbury. And as you understand, it's really... Um, it's all very uh, conjectural, in a sense. Like, we rely on a very few information that that does make sense in... I mean, in general, overall, right? If you consider what can happen on a battlefield, it's just we don't know how to reconcile that with the spaces sometimes, because we don't know how they work. We don't know how to reconcile it. But properly, we don't know. We don't have a quantitative dimension of certain movements, or how uh, the lines were disposed. I I made some hypotheses here that I think are a bit more coherent than the general K. Uh, I'm I'm very much Occamian myself. Like I don't think I have to add too much that we don't know. But at the same time, you have to 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 make things work. And when there is something so absurd, like you know, if you just read through the source limpidly, that you know an entire two thousand men passed through us a lane during a hidden path in the midst of the battlefield in 300 meters it, it's it's just it, it it doesn't make any sense right so you have to explain what things went like and actually Tudor's source the arrival is definitely the best source is the more the most insightful also because the guy was there in in the field that is important to stress but literally the, this unfortunately knows a very few <laughs> means a very few about the the, the reliability that you have to get used to that for battles, it, uh, you know, an eyewitness has is not doesn't give any security in the fact that what he writes is because he's just writing something, and the way he writes that is just it's not even a matter of bias; it's a matter properly of how they they would feel the need to describe the detail of a battle for the sake of its reconstruction. For them, it was not important that how that victory had been concretely achieved, there is something even poetic, you, you, you've read these passages, he wrote decent, he was probably a clergyman, um, uh, the, he, he has this finesse of expression, but the deal there is the Yorkist cause and the victory of Edward, and that's it, so mm, that's what the medieval sources will not tell you exactly, because it's not meant to tell you from their perspective, right, because it wouldn't, you know, other people would would care about how the thing had happened. And unfortunately for military stories, this is mostly not the way you would like it to go. In any case, Tudor's sources uh, Tudor sources are very, very helpful, if you want, because they give you, in spite of their later sources, but they tell you that there was some, you know, broader thing there. There was probably a camp in the battle that was the same camp of, of the Lancastrian army that had, had entrenched the day before. And even though, yes, they could have not, like, made this outs outstanding work of whatever, so still, this doesn't explain how um, how this hidden paths were present, or what, what what's the relevance, however, of that, for that ad adjective used by their arrival. Um, we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't rely on that too much, right? So that, that it still what happened is probably more messed up than the the normal like battle versus battle frontally that we can think. There is some extra movement. There is also the the very interesting the, the flank attack that we think ha occurred because as far as I understand from the sources, we don't actually get um, at which moment it arrived. If I'm not like. Probably nobody explicitates that. It's just uh, this story, the arrival tells of the fear that Somerset would have played some dirty trick, and and Edward countered them by sending those two hundred spears um, uphill to to see. About. But it fits with the logic. It fits with the bloody meadow location. It it fits. It fits with um, with lots of things actually, and also the rest of the movements of how troops took refuge in the Abbey later, right? It's broadly speaking. So, whatever happened in, on that field at that point is probably one of the most interesting. You would like to know how it really looked like, by given this this kind of uh, hide and seek logic that we see there. Uh, we we don't know, and we have to accept at the end of the day that again, it, it's not really probably even the most important thing. Again, what makes the difference is the moral force, is how this the, the broader movements. Also, the the assassination—I uh, mean, the, properly the killing the, of, of Wenlock at the hand of, of 
of Somerset for not having intervened during his attack on Edward Centripetal is, is meaningful. But at the same time, it's also interesting because literally military logic at the time would make you attack mostly really frontally, division against division. So what lack of what, what degree of coordination co could concretely exist, and especially with that terrain, with that kind of... Uh, it's hard to tell, right, in the, in the violence of a battle, in the mess that, that follows. So, so, yeah, so my, my take on this is more or less the one I illustrated, and I think one could go saying, okay, well, yeah, I guess maybe it's reasonable to see it like that. For the rest, it's an interesting battle. Even just the the setting, the the, the characters. I mean, it's fascinating. Um, and there surely is some some other detail here and there, um, but they're mostly stories about individual behavior, what they thought, what things like this. So it's not really that enormously revealed or uh, revealing, because otherwise, you know, it would have fit the broader construction. All right, for today we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video, if you did please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.